So we're switching over. Uh, our next presentation is Thomas Olson. Thomas Olson is the co-founder and board chair of the Center for Space Commerce and Finance. This is a 501c3 educational nonprofit organization focused on catalyzing the growth of the new space economy. CSCS develops educational programs, events, and publications focused on connecting and educating entrepreneurs and investors with the goal of increasing investment deal flow in the commercial space industry. Thomas is also the owner of the New Space Business Plan Competition. During a career spanning more than 30 years, he's held diverse executive and technology leadership roles in publishing, consultancy, and managed services solutions. Respected across the industry, Thomas has helped found multiple startup companies which have supported the success of small to medium enterprise businesses and nonprofit organizations. As a consultant, he employs his business acumen and expertise by guiding companies with their technology investments, strategic planning, financial management, and professional development initiatives. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, the other thing that probably wasn't mentioned my actual day job is I work for a company called Ave Alto in the UK. And they're a, we're an early stage company. We're developing what's called a high altitude platform to provide uh, wireless broadband and mobile backhaul and other types of services to underserved countries around the world, places like Indonesia, for example, that have maybe 15,000 islands, and they're not going to be running fiber optic to each one of them. But one of our, uh, one of our platforms can cover an area almost the size of Panama. So all of a sudden that becomes a very, uh, very compelling thing to do. We're building our first commercial prototype right now. And uh, we consider, comp we consider uh, initiatives like uh, Starlink and OneWeb to be our competitors. So it's a lot of fun and I'm enjoying that a lot. Okay, well, uh, what I'm gonna start with today, we're gonna discuss a little bit uh, ideas about space investment and what it means really to have a space investment. What does that mean? Because sometimes we focus on a very small amount of that. We focus on launch, we focus on things of that nature. They're very expensive and take a long time to achieve results. For example, Elon Musk founded SpaceX 20 years ago with his own money. And really now he's starting to see the reward from that. Um, this in the last couple of three years. So a lot of people don't have the kind of funding and the kind of patience that it takes to get involved, especially in a launch company, and to see any kinds of real returns. Most investors in the VC area or in other areas like to see something in you know, three to five years, maybe a little more, depending on what it is in the tech sector. Well, I have some ideas about that that I wanna to share today. So let me share the screen. You can see the screen. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to share that. And I'm going to fire up my slideshow. Can you all see that? Is it good? OK, I'm seeing a thumbs up from people. Good. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so you've seen that part. You know who I am now. So let's, let's move on. OK, so some of these numbers are going to be a little bit dated. I did first did this presentation about a year and a half ago, and I was asked on very short notice to uh, to do by Michael to do this. So I managed to update some numbers to a little more currency. Uh, some are aren't quite like this one here. 18 billion was invested in uh, in cumulative in space investment in the year 2018. There's probably a little more than that happened in 2019. I don't know what the numbers are for 2020, but I understand that they're actually hanging in there. Um, despite all the global COVID thing that we're in. Um, so but I'm not going to try to find those numbers until after the first of the year. So the point is, we started way back when in the, in the 90s, early 2000s, and there was almost nothing going into this because space was considered an outlier and the giggle factor was still there. And, uh, but we gained capability and when we gained capability, we gained visibility and we gained traction. We started gaining investment and with success bred success, it's led up to where we are now, billions of dollars going into the space industry. So, hey, so I guess our problem solved, right? Every, we got everything we need, you know, we'll launch and we got the support services going and we're all going to Mars, you know, in a few years and everything's gonna be fine, right? Okay, well, all right, Blah, wrong answer, but thank you for playing. Um, when you compare space to just 
other types of technologies and other areas. I mean, healthcare alone is 23 billion. Uh, global mining exploration is 13 billion. Uh, biotech, 29. Tech sector, 61 billion uh, two years ago, and it's even more now. Clean energy spends 332 billion a year. Uh, compared, to, compared to the 18 billion that went to space in 2018, uh, we still have a long ways to go. And probably, I, and probably the reason is most investors that I've talked to going way back to like 2007 were saying they thought space was too rich for their blood. They're used to putting in, you know, a quarter million here, a half a million there, a million dollars someplace else and getting a return in a few years. And they look at space and they go, oh, wait a minute, I don't have tens of millions to put into something. Um, as you can see, just from a couple of years ago, the average seed round for a launch company was 8.3 mil, and the average Series A was 40 mil. And even then, we're seeing companies that don't make it, even with those kinds of numbers and even more numbers. So it's a, it's a very risky business, and you have to be a big player to, to play in that space. So what do we? So what do the rest of us do? This is kind of a presentation for all the rest of the investors out there who have this thing about space. They love space; it it tickles their hearts. But they say, "God, I don't have that kind of money. What can, what can I do instead?" And this is because, and I've been to all these conferences going back 25 years, and it seems to me when we talk space investment, everywhere I go for years and years and years, this is all we talk about because that's all that interested anybody. Because that's the sexy stuff. That's launch and that's spaceports and, and space tourism and you know hauling freight at 100 bucks a pound, hopefully someday. Um, and we're still waiting for some of that. We're getting better. Um, but is that really all we need to declare victory in all this? Well, here's the problem. Yes, launch and tourism and all that is a problem we want to solve or on our way to solving it. But if, if the goal is to be a permanent spacefaring species, sending up permanent settlements that lead to colonies that lead to cities on the moon, Mars, and any place else we want to go, we have thousands of problems we're going to have to solve in order to do it. And a lot, not, a lot, not enough of those get talked about enough at the conferences that we often attend. Uh, it's always focused on the launch side because, again, that's really exciting to watch. Well, here's the good news is entrepreneurs solve problems. Big discovery, right? Um, but total VC investment in startups was $291 billion in 2018. It was almost double the previous year. So that growth is staggering. And half of that was in the US alone. We are still the entrepreneurial nation that leads the world. And we solve problems every day and, and they do so in a way that adds market value. So what do we do with that? Okay. Here's some better news. We had a, the other side of that we had uh, from all those deals that we talked about in the previous slide, we also had almost an equal number of exits. Uh, this last year, there was almost 200 billion in IPOs alone. And in these areas, you don't need to invest tens of millions and then wait you know, 15 years or forever for a return. You can invest in areas where you're investing, maybe investing right now. And it could be kind of a space related investment and you haven't even looked at it like that. And that's where this concept came up for me. And I developed it about a number of years ago. I was inspired by uh, the late Wayne Dyer, who used to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And to me, that was also the best layman's description of quantum entanglement I'd ever seen. So I've, it's always stuck in my mind. I thought, well, how can we change the way that we look at space investment? And so I came up with this definition and you can read this, it's basically a uh, space scalable is a description for a startup product or technology, but it provides immediate benefits to terrestrial customers and terrestrial investors right now. But you can scale it up someday to perform a, maybe do certain upgrades or hardening to perform a use in space when the need exists and when the market exists for that. And there may be things, and there, I'll give you some examples here in a second. There's going to be, there are things that we may be developing right now that don't, they just seem like, oh, another fancy high-tech consumer device. But turns out if you do some, some upgrades to it and you're in place, that could actually be used 
on Mars or someplace else and actually uh, maybe even save somebody's life. So these are good things to have. And it's, it's a really, it's, it's completely turns on its head the old idea that NASA promoted and a lot of other people for decades called uh, spinoffs. And everybody likes to, and NASA still talks about, it. they like to talk about all the spinoffs that they do. It's basically technology that has, that was just shown to have a commercial value that was developed as a result of a NASA contract or some other initiative that they ended up funding for whatever purpose or whatever mission that they wanted to accomplish. And I always saw a spinoff as something kind of, I don't know, serendipitous. It was something that, it was something that, oh, we were going, we were doing this and this and this for this contract, but we discovered this interesting thing over here almost by accident while we were doing it. And so, and some guy, some guy raised his hand you know, in the room and said, hey, could we commercialize that? And not too many people have that kind of mindset when you're working for a NASA engineering or a science contractor. They're, these guys have day jobs and they keep their heads down and they just wanna focus on the work that they're doing to fulfill the requirements of the contract. And something else pops up every once in a while, some guy will say, hey, what about this? Um, I wanna do it from the ground up. I wanna have, I, it's basically, this is, I call this a spin up in some ways. We're developing things on the ground for commercial terrestrial markets, but with an eye to the future thinking, could this thing be used in space as well someday? Well, one example I could throw out there right away, just in the early in the last, this last decade, um, 3D printing was all the rage. And you, you could get, and hobbyists could get uh, smaller pieces of machinery for under a thousand dollars even and put it in their garage and play around with things. Well, one group of guys had this bright idea hey, I wonder if we could do this on the International Space Station. <laughs> and hence came the company Made in Space. And you know, before they did their first launch, I actually got to interview those guys for a, another magazine a long time ago. And, uh, and, but, and maybe other people had those ideas, but these guys had it first and these guys made it work. And they took off the shelf technology and upgraded some of the parts to see if they could work in a microgravity environment. So they did a lot of testing on the Vomit Comet, for example, to make sure the, the parts were working right. And they've got a machine up on ISS right now and it makes stuff for them. And they, they repair things He's right up there right now using parts made on the 3D printer, which is just the coolest damn thing in the world. Uh, so, from this concept of space scalable, we're looking at problems we can solve. Remember that big blank picture puzzle I had up there a couple minutes ago? Well, I, I broke it down into put launch aside for a minute. We have all these other things that we really need to focus on if we're going to have a successful, be a successful spacefaring species. And these are just six very basic topics that you put hundreds of things underneath each one. And these probably aren't all the topics that there are. You guys could probably come up with some more. Um, but these are the kind of problems we have to solve. Medical energy, uh, mining of resources and using them for our own purposes, new types of communication, new types of transport where we're on the moon or Mars or someplace else, uh, bouncing between asteroids. Um, and, but the types of solutions that emerge from considering those problems is in all these other areas. And all these other areas already are getting massive amount of investments at a much smaller but very effective level all over the world every year. Most of that $291 billion in investment a year and a half ago was going into things like this mostly. And so it's already out there. It's just opening your mind a little bit to say, okay, which particular nanotech thing could I get into if that's what I'm into? Uh, that could also have a space use someday. Now this is, yeah, this is one of the slides I couldn't really update. It's just too much time and I had zero time to prepare for this, but, it's, but the concept is still there and it still works. Note that the smaller the investments, the greater the number of them is the only point I was trying to make. And so trying to pull other types of investment into our community, you have to, I wanna look at this. I wanna see, okay, there were 50,000 investments three years ago that were 100,000 or less and almost the same for a quarter million. This is where the bulk of it is going when you put it all out there. Um, very few investments made in an eight figure place. 
So we've got some of the eight figure guys and the seven figure guys. I want to pull in the low six figure guys and figure and find a place for them. Because if they can get involved in a small investment that grows into a larger return in a space related or a space scalable type of operation, they might be, and they, when they take their profit, they might come back and say, okay, what else have you got in space? What else can you do? And I can put in more now because I just made a whole boatload of money on this other thing. Now what, what do you got? And I'm just trying to build a community around that idea and see how we can bring in the rest of the investment world to at least look at what we have or look at what's, what other things we could be capable of. And here's, I'm gonna give a couple examples now. This one, I actually saw this thing, I held it in my hand. Um, it's a beautiful little device, you just blow into it and it performs 10 di different diagnostic tests. And the first time I looked at it, it says, why isn't this thing on the ISS right now? Because I think it would be very, very, very useful. And uh, they've raised some money and they're, uh, and they're getting it into hospitals right now. And it's just the coolest darn thing. Um, next one, I, I met this guy, Jeff Raymond. He, was actually, he actually presented at one of our events a couple of years ago. Um, he's called the Real Martian because uh, he was really trying to build a closed system uh, grow environment just to create enough food to sustain everything. And he did it on this tiny little budget on his own home in Eastern Washington state. And, uh, and he was sharing all his successes and his failures. He was doing a YouTube video like every week for years, sharing his, uh, sharing his adventures. And uh, I just had to have this guy for one of our events. I got him to come down. I found a budget so I could fly him down. And, and he just held the crowd uh, for the whole hour. Um, and he, and through that event, he helped meet some people that helped him get some of his, uh, his new investments, space fund, put some money into, into Eden Grow systems and they're a going concern and they're off and running. Um, this is my favorite thing. I actually, I actually didn't see this for the first time from their ad. I actually saw a science fiction movie 40 years ago with a very young Fred Ward in it called, uh, Time Rider. And it was about a guy on a dirt bike who went back in history by accident. But he had all these what he referred to as techno toys from his friends at Silicon Valley. And one of them included a motorcycle helmet with a heads up display. Well, 19 years later, or no, 39 years later, I'm sorry, here we are. I mean, there's a company in Taiwan that makes this. And, it, and you can see an example of what the heads up display looks like on the screen and they've already raised 1.1 million. That was about a year and a half ago. And uh, I can see this technology going forward because they start from the ground up. This is a consumer technology that's gonna end up in your Martian space helmet someday or something similar to it in a more sophisticated version. Uh, I saw this thing. I wanted to get one of these myself and I don't even ride a motorcycle. I don't know what I'd do with it, but I just love the idea. I just wanted to have it. Uh, so basically, this is the bigger picture. You saw my earlier little slide with that little triangle down there of launch spaceports and tourism. But then I spitballed out there a whole bunch of other things that may at first not seem related to space at all, but in other ways could have are going to play a role in developing a human presence permanently in space. And there's and there's opportunities to invest for as little as the $100,000 level if you just take a good look at uh, what you're investing in and, uh, and why. So again, the goal, as I've said before, we wanna bring a lots of new investors into our orbit. We want to build hundreds of new companies from much smaller investments up and have them all kind of come in. And the pathway for me has been evangelism. I've been evangelizing this idea for a long time now, and I, I feel gratified. There's a couple of investment companies, including Starbridge Capital, that have actually, are actually using uh, the space scalable concepts as part, as part of their investment strategy uh, for long-term investments. So I'm kind of gratified to see that. They're a great bunch of guys, they even put a little money into my company. So I'm very happy to talk them up. Um, but this is how it kind of looks like now. It used to be 
you know, long, long ago, that space, the thing you see in the middle there, used to be actually off to the side somewhere. It was this little redheaded stepchild that no one wanted, really wanted to look at. And everything else on that, on that slide was getting all the attention and all the investment capital. But today, 20 years later, what a change has been made. Um, the dis people are discovering, people in all these industries and the people who invest in them are discovering that space actually has something to offer nearly every industry in the world. And every industry in the world has something to offer space and will offer something to space if we're gonna be a successful space-fearing species for the long term. And that's what I have for you this morning. Happy to take your questions. Sure. Um, so, hi, Tom. Thanks for the hi. shout out. Um, so I, I, uh, I absolutely agree with everything you're talking about. And to the point where, as you said, that's the basis of our entire investment thesis. Um, thank you, so, by the way. <laughs> then, no, thank you. I just feel vindicated, uh, you know, when you guys said that. I was just like, yes, after all these years, you know, sure. in the wilderness, it seemed like. Um, and so for, for those that are not aware, uh, uh, my name is Michael Meeling. I'm one of the general partners at Starbridge Venture Capital, which is a space-focused venture capital fund. Um, so we're out there talking to investors um, who view space as just any other sector. So um, one of the comments that I made in, in the chat was um, one of the important points of, of seeking investment money is that you are competing against every other possible investment that person can make. And an investor is looking for returns. So in the same way where you're rebalancing your investments in your 401k, um, you're looking for the thing that has the risk profile and the returns that you are personally comfortable, comfortable with. Um, and that same thought process is going through any investor that's looking at the space sector is um, I could also take the same money and invest it in this um, ride sharing application and make, you know, a 30x return. And, or I could put it in the space sector company over here and I might make, you know, 2x if I'm lucky. Um, and so that's why uh, as a venture fund, um, there are a lot of things that, you um, are out there that ask us for investment, but they simply do not generate the kinds of returns that people that are looking at the venture capital or equity space expect. And so when we're looking at things in the sector, you have to understand that investments are competitive. When an investor is looking to invest, there are alternatives that you are competing with, um, whether it's a venture fund like us or an individual company, um, just because your space doesn't make you special. Tom, I kind of want to ask you, um, you know, one of the things I kind of took away from your slides was that uh, the investment happens both directions, right? If you are trying to build a space thing and then you create something that we use down here on the ground, that's one direction. And then uh, you're doing something like that helmet that you described you're doing something on the ground that might move to space. Can you talk a little bit about the fluidity of that technology, how it moves, why it matters, maybe a, a flavor of what that does to economic impacts and jobs and, and company development, both directions? Okay. Um, well, the, well, obviously the spinoff side, they've, you know, they've been writing papers about that for 50 years. Um, <clears throat> And that, and and then, and from that, NASA can claim they're the only uh, government agency that actually gets some bang for the buck that that the taxpayers put in, because even with the relatively, even with the numbers of spinoffs that they've managed to produce, and they write a report, they 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 do a big report every year on this. They talk about you know what have we developed that's now going commercial, uh, and it's been a lot. It creates, it's created hundreds of billions of dollars of, over the last 50 years of economic activity and created, you know, tens of thousands of, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs over time. Um, so that's a good thing. 
I, absolutely. I'm not, I wasn't meaning to knock it in any way. It's no, just no, that no. it's, you know, it's, it's the serendipitous part of it that bothers me. You never know when you're going to get something. With a, with a ground up situation, like a space saleable situation, <clears throat> you're focusing like anybody else focuses on in their investing or in their tech development of a, a technology that's hopefully going to enhance people's lives right here on the ground right now. <clears throat> and given an eye to the future, like that helmet, for example, you know, somebody look at that and say, hey, I want to do something in space with that. We had, <clears throat> I think it was in 2012, we had a, uh, we had a business plan competition. It was a pretty big one. We were still under the NASA grants and we were having like hundred thousand dollar prizes, right? And we, and, and when you advertise a hundred thousand prize, some really, really good companies show up to play. Um, a couple of them, well, actually, one of them was Nano Satisfy, and they became Spire. Oh, right. And so uh, you remember those guys. Yeah. Um, uh, go a little further with that, because that's a story worth telling. Okay. Well, uh, well sort of. They okay. didn't win. I now, they presented. I, I remember I was the only person on the judging panel that thought that Nano Satisfy should have won that. And <laughs> indeed, they were the only company that survived the year. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, but they, and, and so the, well, the funny part too for that was that they went to, we have a, <clears throat> the day before the event, we do a boot camp uh, to really give everybody some tips and pointers and some practice on doing their pitches in front of the judges. And we, when we've uh, worked, worked that out pretty well. Um, well, everybody on the Nano Satisfy team showed up for the boot camp that day, except Peter Plotzer, who was presenting. He, had, he was coming in that morning. He had, he had no idea what the other guys had been through. And he was insisting on doing the presentation his own way anyway. So, okay, you know. <clears throat> and then he ran over time and it was, uh, hilarity ensued. But, uh, I, but as a result of, of what they did, there were people in the audience later who, uh, who had started conversations with them and that led to something. Um, including one guy who helped them raise their first million and then one led to five and then you know now the rest is history <clears throat> so yeah that was that was a really fun story from there but there's also another group um they had it was a biotech company and they had a uh this is really a sample example of space scalable for me it's a, it was a biotech company who was inventing a, a basically a treatment an early stage treatment for toxic exposure and radiation exposure. It was literally an IV that you put in. And I know there's a couple guys from, uh, from JSC, Johnson Space Center, who's sitting there and watching that thing. And, he's, and their eyes perked up at the radiation part of it. They said, I think we need that. And we, uh, we at least got to facilitate some introductions for those guys. I don't know how far that went, but uh, there's, they're still going strong. And there were some other companies like that as well who produced things. It didn't seem like space at first, but when you realize what they were doing, oh, it made perfect sense. And they made the cut. At least every time we do a BPC, at least one uh, non-pure space company makes, makes the cut to present. Um, <clears throat> but the point is of that, again, we want to create a larger world where a lot of great products are being made that can, are useful for people right here on the ground, but they're also going to have a space purpose going forward. When we finally do, when Elon Musk finally sends his first settlement to Mars, there's, I wonder, I want to see a <clears throat> hundred different products from a hundred different companies that we helped fund in one way or another go with him. Nice. Are there any other uh, questions from the audience? Uh, can I, I'd like to actually ask a question of the audience. Um, given that uh, what, what Tom is talking about and the, um, the, the dollar amounts, and this is, I'm, I'm not asking for, for Starbridge's case. It's a, um, it is hard for an investor to look at space as a sector, and especially the way Tom looks at it um, in terms of being space enabled, um, 
they want to see the people in the sector investing. Um, and so I, I would just strongly encourage everyone on the, on the call um, to take a look at the sector. Now, the problem that we have in the US and most of the world is um, all of our companies are private, especially all of the, the, the companies that Tom was talking about. Um, and unless you are an accredited investor, um, you cannot invest. Um, or you, you can if you are very close to the company and part of the friends and family round. Um, but if you are an accredited investor, um, and you can easily find the definition online, um, you should probably look at, at uh, taking a chunk out of this industry and participating. But um, one of the things that you will find as soon as you do that is you've become far more discriminating in what you consider to be a viable space company than what you do now. So uh, yeah, uh, take Tom's advice, do it very carefully, find an advisor. And if you are an accredited investor, um, take a look at helping some of these companies. I'd like to just pop in and tell uh, a, a somewhat funny story. Um, uh, Michael Meeling and Tom Olson are my longest space friends in this industry. I literally met them, I think one day and then the next day, or maybe the same day at a, uh, at a Mars Society event back, I believe in 2002, maybe it was 2000. That was actually ISDC. ISDC. Okay. I think it was a Mars Society event. And, uh, and what were we talking about then, Tom? What was what was the point of the, you know the three of us starting to talk uh, nearly twenty years ago? What was what was the conversation? Alternative methods of funding for space related initiatives, which I was uh, in the thick of at the time. Was there such a thing as SpaceX or Blue to uh, to be trailblazers or uh, examples? SpaceX was at least on paper. I mean, Elon technically founded that in 2000 with his own money and gotten very far yet. Their first real successful launch wasn't until 2008. Um, so back then though, everybody had an idea and everybody was going around trying to pitch it. Yep. And that's really how I got involved in this because I was seeing all sorts of great ideas being pitched, but no one seemed to have any bloody business sense. <laughs> great brilliant engineers but everybody had the same idea well build it and they will come is their is their business model i knew that wasn't going to work so actually i took from that moment the very next year and with cliff mcmurray and worked with him at, uh, at nss and we helped found and start the uh, the business track mm -hmm. at isdc that hadn't happened before and uh, i was also key then years later for the International Astronautical Congress, we started something new called the Entrepreneurship and Investment Committee, which I'm still on and it's still going strong. And we might actually do a BPC event there in Dubai next year. So we're, we're working on that. Um, there may be more announcements on this forum in a couple of days. So uh, I'll be back, stay tuned. Would it, would it be fair to characterize the two of you as pioneers in the whole concept of space commercialization. Uh, Y'all both each have a heck of a lot of battle scars. Uh, I, I would like you to just kind of share that. I know I don't want to put you on the spot, Michael, but uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, you have, both of you have some, some background in this. So, so talk about what it was like to be a pioneer. And we only have about eight more minutes, so I don't want to monopolize this, but I want you to, say, to make some predictions about 2022 and 2025. Um, there's an old saying, you know, the, the pioneer because they're the ones with all the arrows in their backs. Right. Um, right. And uh, at the time I was trying to raise money for mass and space systems. I was one of the co-founders uh, with Dave back in 2004. Pointing out that mass and space systems just got a huge contract to go back to the moon. So nice job there. <laughs> but it took 15 years to get there. Right. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, that we tell a lot of our 
a lot of companies that come to us sometimes is um, don't underestimate the value of figuring out how to just stay alive while everybody else drops off. Um, and if I, if I remember correctly, we, Maston is still the only company that survived the original Lunar Lander Challenge and is still alive. Yep. Um, the, the thing that we all remember was hearing no, hearing no so much, just no over and over and over again. Um, but then because of my time in internet startups and even my time now at Starbridge, um, that's life. Uh, even in people that are trying to raise money for a venture fund that's in a normal technology and, and not in the space sector. Um, you hear no 99% of the time, and that's that 1% that gets you over the hump. Um, and it's, um, the as far as predictions, um, so one of the things that Starbridge is, is somewhat involved in is the integrated space plan. And we're, we're developing our own kind of view internally about what the economic view of the sector looks like going forward. Um, we, you can kind of think of Starship as kind of an inflection point where it's very hard to predict what happens afterwards. Um, but we don't think anything uh, significant is going to happen with NASA and DOD during a Biden administration. It's, it's going to keep going as, as it is, which is cool because it's been a pretty good trajectory. Um, no, the thing that we still still struggle with is um, how do we get beyond Earth observation and communications areas, sectors that we've been riffing on since the 60s. Um, LEO commercialization is still a very hard road to hope. Um, business models beyond LEO, uh, well, beyond GEO, um, are still build it and they will come. And we are looking for a reason, an actual value proposition that opens up a large amount of money. But right now we don't see it. Um, we're coming to the conclusion that it really is humans. And then Tom, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, predictions and uh, arrows in your back? Right, well, I have a similar similar saying I, uh, to Michael. I came out of tech sector, so we have a saying there is when you're really going for the bleeding edge, it's usually your own blood that ends up on the floor. Uh, and that is so true. In fact, uh, my kind of partner and current boss, Walt Anderson, is a, is a primary example of that uh, in both his efforts with Mircor and with Rotary Rocket. He put, I know, at least 31 million of his own money into Rotary Rocket, which became a completely, you know, failed technology. And those are the risks you take in this in this industry in particular, when you're really going for the, the cool space stuff. Um, that's what happens more often than not. As far as the future goes, I think I agree with Michael. A lot of things are going to depend on Starship um, in, the, in the next few years to see how, how well that pans out, because that could open up, be the key to opening up all sorts of things. Um, a guy I met once, who was this, years and years ago, he was a science fiction author named Werner Vignier. You may have read some of his novels if you're a sci-fi buff. Um, he used to say, he said in a lecture that then he considered the near future for predictions to be no more than 10 years, the far future to be 20 to 25 years, and anything beyond that, forget it. You're not going to be able to guess anything. So while I am an advisor to the integrated space plan, they go to the year 2100, and so I'm kind of saying, yes, man plans, and God laughs. But uh, well, I, I'm always interested to see how that goes, because this thing been revised multiple times over the years, and maybe a lot of the things they're talking about in the next, say, couple of decades, might act, we might actually just see come to pass <clears throat> in one form or another, maybe not quite the exact same time frame. Some things might come sooner and may, some may come a little later than expected, but it all looks pretty good. But the Starship is gonna be a key to all of this going forward. <clears throat> I have to agree with Tom. Uh, even those of us that work on the space plan will tell you anything past um, 2040 is fiction. <laughs> we know it's fiction. Um, it's not even aspirational. It's just plain out fiction. Um, now, the, the, the problem and the challenge that we see with Starship is we see very, very few um, companies or, or even notional companies understanding what you can do with the capability of Starship. 
And our fear is, yes, Elon is building a great assembly line for Starships, um, but he's going to have to be his own customer because with the exception of Axiom um, and Space Adventures and, and some human stuff, um, there's nobody that we've talked to that's really standing up and say, hey, I want to use a lot of those things. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's going to be a really, really big challenge. Is so from that, Michael, I have a, so from that, I have a question for you. It, so when you look at Starship and the whole thing, do you see it as a DC-3 or a DC-2? I see it as a DC-2 because I don't see somebody standing up um, yet saying I need enough of them to justify the, the, the assembly process for a DC-3. Oh, hold on. Um, for the folks that don't have that background, just describe that, that question a little bit more with uh, the DC-2 versus DC-3. Well, the DC the Douglas DC three when it when it first came out, really kind of reset the paradigm for air travel, and for 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 not only customer transport but for freight and for everything else. It became this workhorse that went on for decades, <clears throat> but there was a DC one and a DC two that preceded it, and those technologies weren't fully fleshed out, and they didn't make them work, and they didn't go anywhere. So, but they still put a lot of resources into those developments. But the third time was the charm, essentially. So we're we're kind of in that transition point where the technology is really close for mass cargo, but we're not quite there yet. And we don't necessarily have the customer base to support the if you build it, they will come business model. Right. All right.